Well, amen. If you take the Word of God this evening, if you would please go with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 34. I pray you've had a good day today, and uh, good to see you back in the house of the Lord tonight. A good crowd for a Sunday evening. We appreciate you being back out with us, and we're looking forward to what the Lord is going to do. We, we love that song, don't we? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And uh, I'm thankful when the Lord shows up. It's a whole lot easier, isn't it? When the Lord is in this place and He's working. And uh, I'm just thankful for what He's doing, what He's done in our hearts this morning. And pray that He'll continue to do His perfect work. If we're ever going to experience a revival in the land, the Lord's going to have to work in our hearts. And uh, He'll chip away, and uh, He'll mold us and make us what He wants us to be, not what we want to be. And uh, I pray that He'll do that in my own heart, in my own life. Second Chronicles chapter number 34. Second Chronicles chapter number 34. Um, I'm going to sort of jump off from the message last Sunday night. And um, I want to look at some revivals that took place in the Old Testament. Now, we're not going to look at all of them tonight. But over the next few weeks, I want to take Sunday evening and look at these revivals that happened in the Old Testament Scriptures. And tonight, we're going to start with this revival under a young king by the name of Josiah. And the record of it is found here in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Now, uh, let me uh, say this before we begin to read. You're going to find out sooner or later, my reading skills are not the greatest. My English is not wonderful. I graduated with a ninth grade level in English, and uh, that was in paces. Anybody do ACE? You know what I'm talking about? I know... So, you know, ACE, I was still in the colored paces when I graduated, so <laughs> you understand where I'm at in English. And uh, so my father-in-law taught me something years ago. He never went to Bible college, but he has such great wisdom. And he told me when I first surrendered to preach, and he said, now, he said, Jason, when you're reading a passage and you get to a word that you can't say, he says, you just cough and go on, <laughs> and the people will never know. Until you get to like the book of Numbers, and someone's bringing you NyQuil because they think you're about to die, because <laughs> I'd have to cough through the whole book, you know, some parts of it. So forgive me. You say, well, that's not how I would say that word. I understand, but I may say it two or three different times before the night's over, but I'll try my best uh, to stay on track here. Verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of David his father and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. And the images that were on high above them, he cut down in the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priest upon their altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh, and Ephraim, and Simeon, and uh, even to Naphtali, uh, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves, and had beaten the graven images in the powder, and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, we thank Thee again for this opportunity to be in Your house. Father, we're so grateful that, Lord, You've given us this time together, and we're thankful for what we've already heard. 
Lord, tonight as we've sung praises to Thee. The choir did such a wonderful job. And Lord, it is good to know that we can say it is well with our souls. And Lord, we just pray tonight that You'd open the Scriptures up to us. And Lord, that You would just help us tonight to glean, Lord, the things that we need. And Lord, if there's just something tonight that You could prick our hearts with, something that would start a stirring in our lives, and Lord, that would uh, a desire for revival would grow. And uh, Lord, we just pray that You'd help us. We love You. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Josiah, if you look in verse 1 again, says Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Now, in my lifetime, we've had some rulers and politicians who acted like they were eight years old. But can you imagine an eight-year-old becoming king? King of the nation of Israel? Now, his upbringing was not the greatest, and we'll see that in a moment. But Josiah was just eight years old, and God did a work in his heart. I'm thankful. As an eight-year-old boy, God did a work in my heart. And God saved me as an eight-year-old boy. We did not go to church often. I remember just a handful of times growing up till then. And uh, it would basically, Dad would take us maybe Christmas and Easter, you know, that type of, type of thing. Uh, but my mom would always make me and my brother watch the television evangelist. And uh, every weekend we had to watch Jimmy Swagger preach. Every weekend. And uh, I remember as an eight-year-old boy, one Saturday morning, as I was watching him and him preaching the gospel, God got a hold of my heart. Nobody was there. It was just me. And that morning, I sat there and I asked Jesus Christ to save me. Amen. I didn't understand everything about it. I still don't understand everything about it. I don't think any of us understand everything about it. But I know that the Lord worked in my life and and uh, that was my beginning as an eight-year-old boy. And he's worked ever since then in a miraculous way. But what I want you to see in this is that God can work in the hearts of young people. Uh, we should never, never think, well, you know, they're too young or uh, they're not going to be able to uh, understand. And listen, they understand more than you know. You know, I understand how it is working and the child, especially in the children's ministry, me and my wife has done it for a long time. And you think, are they even hearing anything I'm saying? But listen, they're hearing. They're, they, they know. And uh, they catch things. And God can work in their hearts even at an early age. And what I want you to see, this revival that takes place that we're going to read about, this revival that takes place, it was sparked by a young person. A teenage boy by the name of Josiah. I'm reminded I like to read about old revivals. I like to read about men like, men like Duncan Campbell and others, those old English revivalists, and how God used them in a mighty way. Well, I remember hearing them tell the story of a revival that took place in Wales. And that revival began on a Sunday morning all because of one little teenage girl who got her heart right with the Lord. The pastor was burdened for revival in his, in his small town village there in Wales. and In his church, he realized how worldly things had gotten and how cold the Christians had become and he was praying for revival and he had a youth meeting. And in that youth meeting, he preached to those young people. And a little girl by the name of Florence Evans sat there that night and she realized what a grip this world had on her. And she went to the pastor and she began to talk to him and he told her that she, she needed to surrender her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. A few weeks later on a Sunday morning, it was another dry service. It was another dead service that Sunday. And the pastor, before he closed the meeting, 
He just asked, does anyone have a word? Does anyone have a testimony? And that girl who had been struggling for weeks under conviction, she stood up and she simply said this, I want everybody to know I love Jesus with all my heart. That's all she said. And at that moment, it is said that conviction swept through that little country church there in Wales. And people began to get right with God. And from that, a mighty revival broke through the land. Listen, revival can come even from the young people. You let some young people get on fire for God, it'd be amazing what could happen in any church. And Josiah was just a young man. So let's look at his conversion. We're just going to walk through the Scriptures for just a moment. Look at his conversion. Look with me again in verse number 3. He says, For in the eighth year of his reign, that means he's about 16 years old when this happened. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. Now, when you think about Josiah, you've got to understand something. He did not have a great upbringing, to say the least. For instance, his grandfather was Manasseh. Manasseh was not a great king. Now, when Manasseh got to the end of his life, he finally turned to the Lord. But then his father, you can see back up in the other, we'll not read it, but his father, Amnon, uh, he did that everything that was wicked in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not last long because his family ended up killing him. They just took and got rid of him. I tell you what, you read the book of Kings and Chronicles, and you see all the things that are happening with those kings, and you see the wickedness that has taken place. Listen, there's nothing new under the sun. We think nowadays is, you know, oh, it can't be anywhere. Listen, it was bad back then too. And uh, we see that his upbringing, what, he was not raised in Sunday school by no means. You know, uh, he didn't have a father. He didn't have a mother who would sit down with him and read him the Bible. He didn't have somebody that made sure he went to church and he was under preaching. That didn't happen for Josiah. He was not raised that way. Now, some of you are like me. I, uh, some of you, yeah, you, you know, I wasn't early on, but by the time when I got saved at the age of eight, it wasn't long after that, my dad got saved and my brother got saved and we started attending church and, uh, and they're still in that same church today serving the Lord. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, the, some of you, you know, you wasn't raised that way. Some of you sitting here, you, you wasn't brought up in church. You didn't have that privilege of somebody praying for you and, and making sure you had the knowledge of God in your life. That didn't happen for some of you. But listen, don't use that as an excuse not to do things for the Lord. Some people say, well, I just... Uh, you know, you, preacher, you don't understand the way I was raised. I understand there's carryover. I understand there's scars. I understand there's things like that. But the truth is, listen, past is past. You know, uh, God can give a new beginning right now at this very moment. And uh, you can serve God in spite of what may have happened in the past or the influences you had. And uh, listen, they, he didn't have a great upbringing but he decided, you know what, I'm going to serve the Lord. He decided, I'm going to do what's right. I want to see this land go back to God. And Josiah decided to do what was right. And he began to purge the land. Now, understand this also. You say, was there a preacher in Josiah's life? There was a preacher in his life after he became king. That preacher was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a big influence in the life of Josiah. And even and Jeremiah mentions and talks about Josiah in his writings. And, and uh, so he had some influence in his life. He had a man of God in his life. 
And listen, you know, we need to be careful when we think about uh, uh, preachers and we think about leaders. And, and listen, we should, always, uh, uh, we should always lift them up to our young people. We really should. Uh, you know, our young people are watching what we're doing. They watch how we live our lives. Our children watch us, and they see how we handle situations. They hear the things that we say when no one else is around. And listen, we need to be careful with that. Notice something here. I thought this was interesting. I had to underline it in my Bible. Look in verse 4. It says, And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, the they there, I, I don't know exactly, but it, it's apparently people that are, that are an influence to Josiah. And what do they do in his presence? They break down these images. They, they tear down the images of Balaam. They're saying, they're not, it's not, uh, can I put it this way? They're not saying, Josiah, you do what I say, not what I do. But they did it in front. They didn't just tell Josiah, hey, we need to get rid of them images of Baal. We need to get rid of this false worship that's going on in Jerusalem. They didn't just tell Josiah. They said, no, Josiah, we're going to show you this is what we're going to do. You know, there's a lot of things in the Christian life. It's better caught than it is taught. You say, what do you mean by that? There's a lot of things that you don't have to teach somebody, you can just show them. Especially when it comes to young people. They're constantly watching. And listen, it's not just say, well, you know, teenager, you need to read your Bible. No, they need to see mom and dad reading their Bible. It's not just, no, you need to make sure you pray. You need to do this. No, they need to see mom and dad pray. You know, Josiah, he saw them. He watched as they tore down those images in front of them. And listen, it's so important that we, we are that way with, end of, with people in our lives. So we see his conversion. Look at the reformation that takes place. Beginning there in verse number 4. It says, he, it says, and they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. Now, you know, Balaam is the one who, who uh, you know, he was sent to curse the children of Israel. Remember uh, that story there? And God wouldn't let him curse them, and, and the, but instead he had to bless them. And from there, there, there was a worship of Balaam that took place. He says that they tore down in his presence the images that were on the high above them. He cut down in the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He broke in pieces and made dust of them. And he strolled it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. Sounds like he meant business, doesn't it? I mean, he began to get all these things out of his life. Josiah said, I don't want this false worship. I don't want these images. They, they go against God. They, 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 they are in the place of God. And he said, I want them out of the way. And he goes to far as, I mean, he burns them. He gets rid of them. And I mean, then he, he starts to take them and he spreads them, uh, the ashes on the grave of those priests who had made these sacrifices to these false gods. It says, but, and he burnt the bones of the priest upon the altars. And he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Every city he went and he broke down the altars. He broke down the graven images. He repaired the temple. He did everything that when you look at it, you think, man, he's doing everything right. When you look at it, just on the surface, when I look at that, I think, man, he's got something going here. He's seen all the wickedness going on the land. He's going to clean it out. He's going to take care of it. He's going to reform the nation. But I want you to know something. Reformation is not the same as revival. Just because, listen, you can, you can move all these things out. Here's the problem. Josiah, I'm going to get all this out. I'm getting all these images. I'm getting everything out. But what are you going to put in the place of it? 
You understand when you move something out, something comes in the place of that. You ever clean anything out of the house and you empty a room? How long does it take for that room to fill back up? It don't take long at all. You snap your fingers and there it is. It's full again. Well, listen, just because you're saying, well, I'm going to get this out of my life, I'm going to get all the negative things out of my life, I'm going to get this sin out of my life, and I'm going to, I'm going to reform myself. Listen, revival is more than reforming. Because here's the problem. If you don't replace it with something, it's going to be worse than the first time you cleaned it out. So there has to be, it's more than that. And here's what happens. I want you to see, here's what happens with Josiah. Now, he comes to the Lord, his conversion, we see. We see a reformation. He begins to cleanse everything. But then he finds something. He finds something. Look with me beginning in verse 14. Look what happens here. Look down in verse 14. It says, And when they had brought out the money, now, He's talking about, listen, we're going to go in. We want you to go in and clean the house of God out. They had idols in the house of God, all this. And Josiah says, listen, we're going to straighten this thing out. We're going to get back to God. We're getting rid of all this, you know. We're going to be, we're going to be right when it, comes, when it comes to doing the right thing. And, and we're going to be, uh, can I say it this way, without... without uh, 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 hurting anything. Listen, we're going to be conservative. You know, you can be conservative and still not be a Christian. You know, we got to be careful with this when we look at things like that. And he said, I want to move everything out. We're going to clean it up. But notice as he's cleaning the house of God, verse 14, and when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Saphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book unto Saphan, and Saphan carried the book to the king and brought it, the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they had gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the overseers and into the hands of the workmen. Then Saphan the scribe told, king, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Saphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. You know, everything's going well for Josiah. He, he is conversion. Now a few years later, he says, you know what? I'm going to clean this place up. I'm going to do what's right. We're going to get rid of all this, this, these images. We're going to get rid of all this false worship. We're going, to get it, we're going to clean it up. Now that's wonderful. And I'm not against that. And that's a great thing. But as they were cleaning up, the priest, Hilakai, as he's dusting things and moving things over, all of a sudden he finds a book. And Hilkiah realizes what this book is. It's the Word of God. See, they were trying to do all this reformation, and they were trying to get it, they were trying to get right without the book. And listen, you'll never get right unless you have the book. Until you get like Hilkiah and say, I found the book. <laughs> You have to find the book. And when he found the book, he brings it back. And King says, you got everything ready? He said, oh yeah, we've been cleaning that. Uh, King, let, but before I leave, listen. While I was in there, I found a book. You know, and I realized this is the law of Moses. This is the very words of the Creator, Jehovah God. I found this book. And so what? So no doubt the conversation happens here, and Josiah says, "Well, read it to me." Now, what do you think about something? When he opened up the book of Moses and to begin to read, it would have taken him around nine hours. 
Think about that. Think about Josiah sitting there on the throne and Saphan standing there holding that book or would have been a scroll back then and he begins to read. And for nine hours he sits and listens to the Word of God. And when he hears the Word of God, what happened? What happened? Look what happened again in verse 19 at the end. That he rent his clothes. You say, what's that mean? Here's what happened. Repentance and change took place. See, we think him by moving all those images out, cleaning all that up, that that's, that was repentance and change. No. Repentance and change happened when he got a hold of the book and the book got a hold of him. See, all these things you can do. You can, listen, you can clean up, you know. And listen, it, you, you can clean up as good as you think. Listen, I think I'm speaking span. But listen, that doesn't bring repentance. That doesn't bring ch real change in your life. But what can and what will is when you find the book and you get in the book and when you begin you know what happens to the you know what happens when you get in the book this bible you know what this bible is this bible is a mirror how many of you like mirrors i remember hearing one time jay vernon mcgee everybody you you probably heard jay vernon mcgee on the radio and uh I remember hearing him one day, and he said he went to this self-help conference somewhere. And that guy told him, said, what you need to do is you need to go home. And when you get home, you need to look in the mirror, and you need to say, I love you three times. And Jay Vernon said, well, I guess that's what I need. And he said, I went home. He said, I stood in front of the mirror, and I looked, and I looked. And he said, finally said, I don't love you. I don't even like you. <laughs> you know, is that not what happens when we get in God's Word? It shows us who we really are. You know, we can fool a lot of people. I can fool a lot of people. And so can you. But we cannot fool the mirror. The Word of God tells us the truth. And Josiah, when he looked at himself, oh, he cleaned up good. He had gotten everything out of the way. They made sure they swept. But what was missing? The Word of God is what was missing. And then they have the book in verse 30. You'll see it says in the king, look over in verse 30, and the king went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people great and small and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. Can you imagine? It had been over 75 years. 75 years since they had heard the word of God. And after Josiah hears, in his ears as Saphan reads him that book, and conviction falls under him. And he realizes, yes, I've reformed, but if I want true revival, i got to do what's in this book. And what does he begin to do? He says, you know what? I can't keep this to myself, but the whole nation needs to hear it. And they have a church service. Could you imagine going to a church service today? You had no singing. You had no fellowship. You had no music playing. But a man gets up and just simply reads the scriptures for nine hours. Could we handle that? And in this case, I'd say most of the people stood for nine hours as they heard the word of God. But as they heard the word of God, it began to do its perfect work among them. You say, what did it do? Listen, it sparks a great revival that you can keep reading. A revival that takes place in the days of Josiah that they bring back the feast, they bring back the Passover, all these things. And they begin to do what is written in the book. 
You say, what, does, what happens when we read the book? Well, let me give you some things quickly. It'll bring fear among the people. That's what happened in his day. It brings fear. Here's another thing. They've seen their sins through God's eyes. See, it's different when we look at it through His eyes. When we begin to look at our sin the way God looks at our sin, it's a completely different thing. It brought the power needed for revival. And you know the interesting thing is, the power was always there. I remember years ago, my grand, both my grandfathers and grandmothers are in heaven. They all knew the Lord. I remember the day I went over after church. Uh, we went over to my dad's mom and dad about every Sunday for Sunday dinner, you know, after church. And I remember the day going over to their house. And I remember when we walked in the door, Papa said, I, I got something to tell you all. He said, I want you to know I got saved this morning. He was not brought up in church. He didn't bring my dad up in church. And uh, he had gotten saved later on in life. And I, I, still, I still remember that day walking in that Sunday morning and Papa talking about how, how the Lord saved him that day and how wonderful it was. But I can remember him telling me a story. He loved to tell stories, you know. I loved to sit, I'd love to sit down and he would tell me, especially when he'd tell me stories about my dad. I always like to hear stories about things dad got into, you know. Because I, when I would get in trouble, I would remind him what Papa told me. But my Papa told me one time, he said, he said, you know, Herschel, that's my dad, he said, Herschel, he, he, uh, he had a lead foot, you know. And he liked fast cars. And, uh, and uh, he, he, he had a 55 Ford, a 55 Ford. And uh, he uh, was getting in trouble with that car. And, uh, you know, the little blue lights would follow him home occasionally and made sure he went home and parked it, that type of thing, because back then, all, you know, they wanted to drag race a lot. So my papa said, you know what? He said, I, I got to your dad. I had to figure out how can I help this situation. He said, well, he said, your dad was gone one day, and he said, I went out, got under that 55 Ford, and I got me a drill. And he said, I drilled right through the floorboard, right at the gas pedal. And he said, I put a boat up through there <laughs> to where that gas pedal would only go down so far. <laughs> and uh, he said, one day... He said, it wasn't look, just a day or two after that. He said, he said, your dad came to me and said, he said, that, he said, he said my car, I can't, even, I can't even do like 40 mile an hour. There's something wrong with my car. And Papa said, well, let me go look at it. And he said, we walked out and I got in the driver's seat. And before, before your dad could get in, he said, I reached under there and unscrewed that boat. And he said, that thing run just fine. Now, my dad tells a completely different story. But here's what I, here's, I tell this to let you give an illustration. Listen, the power was there. There was just a little boat that was blocking it. You know, the power for revival is there. Just what's blocking it? You know, what's that boat in your life and in my life that is keeping us from experiencing the power of God through His Word. You know, it's simp the Christian life is a, is a life of simplicity and godly sincerity is what Paul says. You know, every pastor has told you the same things. And there's nothing new under the sun. There's two things to the Christian life that you have to constantly do, and there's two things that the devil is constantly trying to keep you from. You know what those are? Praying and reading your Bible. That's it. Well, I want some kind of formula for revival. How about just pray, read your Bible? Pray, read your Bible. And if I was to ask you tonight, 
what is your greatest struggle in your Christian life, I guarantee you, you would say, praying and taking time to read my Bible. Because that's what the devil's trying to keep from you. But that is the power that can bring revival. Now, what happens in these Old Testament revivals? And I'll close with just a few statements. As we walk through these Old Testament revivals, as we begin with Josiah, there's some things that are going to, we have to understand through them. The first statement is this. The place that we put the Word of God will determine the amount of revival we'll receive. If this book dominates, then God will move. What place do we put this book? You say, well, what place did God put it? God says in the Psalms that He's lifted His book above His name. What place, what place does the Word of God have in your life? What place does it have? I mean, honestly, how uh, do we pick it up? Do we read it every day? Do we study every day? And listen, I'm not saying you have to read a lot, but do you get something and meditate on it? You know, it would be good just to get one verse tomorrow morning and meditate on that verse all day long. Some people think, well, if I don't read four or five chapters a day, then I'm not... I, listen, you'd be better off just to read a few verses if it'll stick with you for the rest of the day. And it'll help you get through. What place are we putting God's Word? You know, I'm afraid it, it don't have the place that it needs to have if we want revival. If we want revival. Another statement, and I'll stop with this one. Every generation has to rediscover God's truth. You know, I'm thankful for my, for my heritage. I'm thankful um, uh, for the past. I love to read, as I said, about revivals, history, how God moved. And uh, I love hearing stories, and no doubt, I've already heard stories, how God's moved here in the past. And that is so wonderful. It's obvious how God's worked in this church. And other churches, as you re you love to hear about that. But here's the truth. We have to rediscover that today. Every generation, listen, every generation has to defend the truth. You have to fight for it. Earnestly contend for the faith, Jude says. Every generation has to contend for it. And every generation has to rediscover that truth for themselves. God only has children. God does not have grandchildren. And we all have to rediscover it for ourselves. We can, I believe, have revival today. Some people say, well, it's over, stick a fork in it, we're out of here. Well, that's fine. I'd love to hear the words come up hither tonight. I would love to hear those words. But listen, I still believe that God can bring revival in our land. I read about this day and how wicked it was in Josiah's day, but God used an eight-year-old boy and saved him. And he brought a mighty revival to the land because, not because he reformed, not because he cleaned up, not because of all, no, 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 because he found God's Word. And he made God's Word the most important thing to that nation. And that is what brought revival. I want to challenge you tonight to make much of his Word. Make much of it. Love it. Get in it. Let it get in you. And it would be amazing to see what God can do in your life. Right here. What God can do in your life. In your family. 
not just the church. Listen, I'm talking about just your home. What could God do in your home if you just got the Word of God? You know, whatever happened, and, and listen, <clears throat> I'm, I am no po- poster child. Let me say this. I have failed tremendously through my life. But what would it do tonight if you decided, especially you, like me, you, you still have children at home, if you would determine to open up God's Word sometime during the day with them and reading God's Word with them and praying with them? wonder what that would do. I'm not saying go home, throw the TV away. I'm not saying all that stuff. What's that going to do? How about go home, just cut it off, get God's Word out, sit down for just a few minutes, and read the Bible together, and pray together. You say, well, I don't have children at home. It's just me and my wife. How about that? How about that? How about just you two sit down together? You don't have family at home. It's just you two. How about you two sit down together? Read, just read a passage of Scripture and pray together every single day. I wonder what it would do. I wonder what it would do. You say, Preacher, I don't know what it would do. Well, won't you try it and tell me what happens? See what God can do in your life and in your home. Because revival will only begin in your house and the importance you place on that word, and then it will carry over to the house of God. Would you stand with me? Thank you so much for listening tonight. I want to challenge you to do that. I know the Lord can work. And listen, I'm, I, I'm trying to be... Uh, I'm trying to follow the Lord. I'm trying to use as much discernment as I can. My mind is going many different ways, you know. But I do know that what I'm giving you tonight is right. And I do know that it can help you and it can help your home. They're going to play through a hymn or a song here in just a moment. Maybe tonight you need to say, you know what, I, I'm going I'm to come tonight and I'm going to commit to God's Word. Maybe you're like me, you've, you've had failures. That, you know, you could commit tonight and you could say, I'm going to go home, I'm going to do it tonight, and by the time you get home, you forget about it. And then you know what Satan does to you and he does to me? He whispers, you're just a failure. You might as well give up. No, no. You know what you do? You determine, I'm going to do it tomorrow. You say, what if I mess up tomorrow? You determine you're going to do it the next day. And you just keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. You say, I'm going to fail. Yeah, you're going to fail. We're all going to fail. But what you need to do is you get up and you just keep going. You keep going. You keep trying. You keep getting in the Word. So I want to challenge you tonight. Is they, You can just begin playing. Maybe you want to come tonight and say, I'm going to commit to reading God's Word. I'm going to commit to making God's Word the most important thing in my home. You say, preacher, I'm already doing that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Maybe you need to say, Lord, just help me do it more. Help me do it more. What is, word, what is God's Word at your home right now? Is it priority? Is it, does it matter at your home? Maybe you need to come and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Listen, there is no shame. Please, there's no shame in coming to an altar and saying, Lord, will you help me? Don't ever be embarrassed to come to an altar, okay? Don't ever care what somebody may think. If you come to an altar, you know what an altar is? You know, an altar is a place to die. Die to self. Die to others. And say, Lord, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you everything. 
some are praying, maybe you need to come pray tonight. You be obedient to the Lord, however He's spoken to you.